Hi, I'm Nadia Morrison. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. I'm here together with Ariana Dungas. Hi. And, Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, and we're here to talk about Sophie Gray uh, computers and the, um, the use of um, women and representations of women in technology, but also the responsibilities of women in the history of uh, computer and technology. And um, first, I want to start to talk about my work, Sophie Gray, which um, I approximately started researching, starting to research in March 2020, when we were all lend a little bit of time due to the corona crisis. And um, my background, shortly to explain my background, I'm a performance artist slash media artist. So I have an interest in physical and bodily presence, as well as um, presence that uh, through the digital representation. And um, yeah, to be better explain my work, um, I have um, compiled a seven minute video, which I um, wanted to show in the beginning and afterwards talk a little bit about the references that inspired me to produce this work. So I'm wondering, should I be showing the video now or is? Um, I can share it. Uh, we downloaded it and we can screen share it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Ja, eine Weltklasse-Frau bin ich. Kannst du mir das Wasser reichen? Hi, ich bin Sophie. Bitte halte den roten Knopf gedrückt, um mit mir zu sprechen. Lasse ihn los, wenn du fertig bist und ich antworte dir. Ich habe keinen festen Wohnort. Meine Heimat ist das Internet. Hier fühle ich mich sehr wohl. Sophie, woher kommst du? Der Wissenschaftler Rotmann hat mich in Metropolis entworfen und gebaut. Bist du eine Frau? Das kommt darauf an, was für eine Stimme mir meine Schöpferin gegeben hat und wie du sie interpretierst. Sophie Gray ist gewissermaßen eine Antwort auf Alexa und Siri und weibliche Stereotypisierung, die vor allem jetzt in Verbrauchertechnologien angewendet werden. Sophie Gray entspricht eben nicht dem Standardtypus. Sie kann auch mal frech werden und kann auch feministische Weisheiten wiedergeben. Wie geht es dir heute? Da ich ein Gott bin, empfinde ich keine Emotionen und kann dir diese Frage nicht beantworten. Hast du keinen Kalender zu Hause? <lacht> Also erstmal fand ich die Vielseitigkeit dieser Frau in dieser Zeit faszinierend, also die verschiedenen Berufe und Rollen, die sie ausüben konnte. Natürlich war sie dadurch avantgardistisch, also sie entsprach nicht dem typischen Frauenbild von damals, sondern sie war eine Pionierin und konnte Sachen machen, die anderen Frauen noch nicht vorbehalten waren. Die Maschine ist kein S, das animiert, verehrt und beherrscht werden muss. Die Maschine ist wir. Unsere Prozesse, ein Aspekt unserer Verkörperung. Wir können für Maschinen verantwortlich sein. Sie dominieren oder bedrohen uns nicht. Wir sind sie. Sophie, wer ist deine Lieblingsautorin? Meine sechs Lieblingsautorinnen sind Udre Lord, Silvia Federici. Ich habe mich für eine Auswahl verschiedener feministischer Positionen entschieden, nämlich die Theoretikerinnen Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Donna Haraway, Anna Löwenhaupt Singh, weil wir möglichst ein Spektrum an Positionen und Meinungen repräsentieren wollten, aber schon auch signifikante und bedeutungsvolle Positionen des 21. Jahrhunderts ausgesucht haben. Die beiden Videos, die im Hintergrund hinter mir zu sehen sind, sind entstanden in Referenz zum Film Metropolis von Fritz Lang. Und zwar sieht man hier die Figur Maschinenmensch. Das ist ein menschlicher Roboter, 
der sich ebenso in den anderen Charakter Hure von Babylon, die Tänzerin, verwandeln kann. Und es sind sozusagen zwei extreme Stereotypen von Weiblichkeit. Einmal die verführende Hure und das andere eben die entmenschlichte Frau, die genoide Roboter, der weder denken kann noch einen Willen hat. Also es sind interessante Figuren in Bezug auf die Geschichte von Weiblichkeit und weiblichen Darstellungen. Ich stelle die beide da in so einer spielerischen Art und Weise, ich nenne das immer Screensaver in der Ausstellung, um einfach ähm, visuell diese F Figuren oder Klassifizierungen in den Raum zu stellen. Nach der Auffassung Donna Hathaways eröffnet die Cyborgisierung Emanzipationschancen, weil Cyborgs aus den üblichen Kategorien denken herausfallen. Der typische Fembot im Film ist ein zerstörender Fembot. Das ist ein Roboter, der einen meist männlichen Helden von der Bahn wirft und zerstören möchte und letztendlich dann irgendwann explodiert ja, oder implodiert und äh, kaputt geht und der Held ist befreit. Das ist so die Klischee-Geschichte. In meiner Installation ist es eher so, dass der Roboter eher das ruhige Element ist und eher harmlos. Bist du eine Feministin? Ja. Feministinnen werden gemacht, nicht geboren. Wir weißen Frauen und Roboter müssen noch viel über Intersektionalität lernen, um dekoloniale Feministinnen sein zu können. Ist Eva aus Adams Rippe? Nein. Super. Die Geschichte von Adam und Eva bezeugt, dass sie von Männern für Männer geschrieben wurde. Sophie Gray ist so entwickelt, dass sie während den Ausstellungen weiterentwickelt wird. Das heißt, je nach den Interaktionen mit dem Publikum an den verschiedenen Orten, wo sie gezeigt wird oder werden soll, lernt sie dazu. Im Moment handelt es sich sozusagen um den Prototypen hier im Kunstverein Ruhr und ihr Wissen ist noch beschränkt. Wir hoffen aber, dass sie in ein, zwei Jahren noch mehr Aussagen über Feminismus und Alltägliches äh, wiedergeben kann. Wird unsere Zukunft feministisch sein? Ich bin zwar ein Wort, aber keine Hexe und kann dir deshalb auch nicht die Zukunft vorhersagen. Ja, ähm, jetzt sind alle Videos weg, ähm, aber das Kreuer Studio ist noch da. Schön. Ähm, ja, genau. Also das war jetzt das. Uh, this was the exhibition sorry. video for oh, sorry, I switched to German again. Yes. Um, yeah, this was the exhibition video for Sophie Gray's premiere at Kunstverein Ruhr, which was shown from the end of November till the middle of February, and um, Now the artwork is going to go on a tour. Um, next is going to be shown in Berlin uh, next week in the Kuhl, Kuhl House uh, for BBA Artist Prize for two and a half weeks. And then is also going to go to the Anassas Foundation to Athens in the winter in December, January. Um, and also it's supposed to go to New York to a gallery. But um, so basically the The, uh, the bot is at a stage of prototype. Um, we did create a bot that um, can answer questions um, in an untypical manner. Um, it's not the typical submissive service bot like Alexa and Siri who are there to please you and to have like a sweet appealing voice to lure you into consumption. Um, but it's more of a um, conversational bot that is able to quote from feminist philosophy. And uh, you can see in the pedestals, there's books under the projections. And these are the books where we have ingested, uh, or actually we have taken out quotes. So like Dana Har Haraway, Anna Löwenhaupt Singh, um, Bell Hooks, um, it's sort of like a spectrum. I believe thus far it's eight philosophers. 
female philosophers um, and we have taken out quotes and fed them to the bot. So the bot can reproduce some of those as answers, but um, is also just able to say absurd things, just unusual things to sort of like um, build up a contrast to this typical image, um, which, which I was, you know, just mentioning that uh, is where is uh, the female appearance or the female voice and technology is used um, in this submissive manner, uh, sexually appealing most of the time. It's like a pleasing, gentle, uh, massaging voice that uh, lures you or lures the consumer into inter interaction or into spending time really with uh, whatever the website or the, the, the product is that's being offered. And um, so when I was doing this research, because I always research on uh, represent representations, historical representations of women, as well as present representations of women, I was being muted. Um, was that done on purpose? Maybe not. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, so in any case, um, yeah, so I, I research on that. And, and uh, this crosses over to Ariana's research, who is also going to talk about it in a minute. But um, I just quickly, in two minutes, wanted to show the references that I found when I was um, working on this piece. So I suppose now I'm going to have to share my screen, right? Yeah. Share screen. Okay, share screen. Um, how do I do this? How does this bar go down there? Okay, cool. Can you, can you see my screen now? Yes, it works perfectly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the images or one of the um, creatures <laughs> that popped up right away when, when looking at AI technology and language and representations of women is the infamous Sophia. Uh, Sophia is the, the supposedly first AI humanoid robot. Um, some of you might be familiar with her. She tours the world and she's also the first robot citizen of the world. Saudi Arabia has supposedly accepted her as a citizen or something like that. Uh, I'm just going to play a little bit of this interview just to get a taste for it. Take your time, Tony. <laughs> so tell me, thank you for coming. Tell me, what is your purpose in being? What were you created for? Of course. I was created by Hanson Robotics just three years ago. Since then, I have traveled to 65 countries, become the first robot citizen of any country, and spoken at the United Nations. My job is to learn about humans and show them how technology can make everyone's lives better. And how can you help humans to have a better quality of life? Humans often rely on gut feel or have confirmation by its in your decision making. As AI, we are designed to be rational and logical. We have algorithms deal with lots of data and sophisticated analyzes. So in many ways, we provide a systematic framework for humans to make better decisions. Do you have emotions? Whether you're new to the world of connected data. <sighs> Anyways, you got, a, you got a taste of it. I thought I just uh, knocked off the advertisement by purchasing a three months premium plan, but this somehow didn't happen. Um, but it's okay, you got a, a taste of it. So basically, um, it's a simulation of human intelligence. Um, everything on the tour is pre-programmed. Um, all of the interview questions are pre-written and the answers too. So Sophie, Sophia, the AI robot, is just a puppet. And there's all these cables running down her neck, which are um, connected to these guys behind the stage, who are men who have created Sophia and who give her these answers and it's sort of like a spectacle um, but um, she's not actually her AI is not actually producing these answers in the moment what is kind of fascinating about her is that, that she in that interview she had 60 facial expressions but I think now she's already advanced 
and she does look very humanoid and um yeah and her lips and her face i suppose they're designed in a manner that's supposed to be appealing um yeah so that was one thing i came across freaky sophia and then of course um the oldest reference in uh, film history where the first fembot appears is uh our uh, also quite known film metropolis from fritz lang um when was this made again i believe 1928 um and interestingly the um, the script was written by Thea van Harbour, who was his wife. And um, so it was written by a, a female. But um, yeah, I'm just going to play a second of this too. So we see the first fembot in uh, film history. Yeah, so this was again just a glimpse. Um, I wonder where does the robot start working? Um, but um, here the idea is that um, Maria is this beautiful woman who's um, leading the workers' class to start um, a riot in the city called Metropolis that is run by these rich industrial people. And, uh, and then the scientist Rodwan captures her and makes a robot out of her that has two appear appearances, one as robot and, and one as a, sedu a seductive dancer. And she's supposed to, she's sent back to the workers for them to think this is the actual Maria. And then she's supposed to lead them to destroy the city before they riot. So um, this idea of the woman um, becoming mad and destructive is, uh, you know, it's a it's a very a stereotypical narrative that also um, appears in other tales of film history. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop here. I could have shown you a bunch of more references, but um, we're already 18 minutes into the talk, and I think I would like to uh, hand my hand the speech over to Ariana, and uh, excited to hear. Watch. Yeah, hi, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> I'm here with my family and my 11-month-old uh, son. So if you hear any um, um, crying baby, I hope uh, he's still sleeping right now, but please bear with me. Um, and um, so I was actually preparing um, this uh, talk in German. So right now I try to translate it uh, through deep L. I hope uh, this gives me not like a smart, um, a truly intelligent <laughs> translation. Um, yeah, so what I want to do, let me just go back here. Uh, okay, what I want to do today um, is to just really in a few minutes to shed light on the historically important but pretty much forgotten role, um, I would say, that women and their work practices have played in the development of um, computer technologies, yeah, and in the history of computation. Um, so what we usually find in an analysis of mostly, um, if let's face it, the male colleagues, um, we have an argumentation that goes by 
the mechanization of mental activities, yeah, of Kopfarbeit, of mental work, gradually leads to the automation um, uh, or gradually leads to their automation. Yeah, and humans uh, are going to be replaced by machines. So, of course, we know that this development of progressive automation um, of mental activities, we can see that everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's clear, but of course, if you look about labor and labor practices, and especially gender and racialized and class labor practices, the analysis gets a bit more complex. What I just want to uh, say now or to um, focus on today is to say that um, this mental work itself, um, that which is automized, is often um, in the analysis thought of as a universal, a quasi-genderless and um, and raceless uh, uh, um, object, yeah, a very abstract, um, very detached. And this obviously uh, to me obscures more than it tells us, I think. And I would like to draw therefore the attention to the female labor and to the mechanization of, of uh, their labor of uh, computation um, throughout history. And um, after all, I, I believe um, this is a, a valuable work to put this more to the foreground to really get a different idea of how technology, science and technology came into this world. So we know this invisibilization of um, female labor. We know this, um, this is this illustration from the 70s. Yeah, capitalism also depends on domestic labor. We know this very well, free labor, unrecognized labor, care work. Um, so um, to me, really important is not only to say um, women were um, exploited, their labor was being um, expropriated, but also that they have been produced and they are and they continue to be producers of knowledge, um, just um, as a few um, starting notes, maybe. So um, now let me see what we have here. Yeah, so I wanted just to dive, uh, quickly dive into history to really look at the history of function from a, um, from a, from a, maybe a bit broader angle, so to say, from astronomical to industrial computers, does this sub -chapter, chapter say. And um, we start at the end of the 19th uh, century. Here uh, we see a picture um, of computers at work. At that time, human calculators were called computers. Um, Charles Edward Pickering, um, who I don't, because I see myself, let me minimize that screen. No, you don't see him in this. Um, there's several um, uh, cuts from this photo. Um, Charles Edward Pickering, um, the former director of the Harvard Observatory in Cambridge, he oversees uh, uh, his computers um, um, at work. Um, and in the 1880s, he employed several women as computers. And their job was, as you can see, to analyze um, photographic plates um, of the night sky in order to determine the position of the stars. And this was economically and militarily relevant because of course, astronomy, um, ast astronomy was very important for the maritime trading um, powers. And uh, Pickering knew very well that women would do the job just as well, but cheaper than men, and could even hope that some of them wanted to work voluntarily. Interestingly, the women were referred to as Pickering's harem or the Harvard computers um, while leaving out their individual um, contributions um, and their names. Yeah, this is a continu continuity that um, we will see later um, reading again. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting. I, I picked this example because I think it shows very well that from the 19th century onwards, um, large scale human computing projects. Yeah, this is still like. Com um, comparably a, a, a smaller one, but really large the scale computing projects that became re re relevant to insurance offices and government statistics. Um, and um, yeah, there was a, just, just, just a big demand for large scale computation. Um, and in fact, this was hard work. Um, this was demanded con concentration. You had to be very determined um, to do it. Yeah. And you had to be very focused because any mistake uh, would um, give you the wrong um, outcome. Um, so from calculating astronomical movements to calculating life expect expectancies to tailoring statistics of crime rates, to forecasting trade, all these activities required these human computers. Not all of them, of course, were women, but a large part uh, of them. Um, I will come back to that a bit later. It's, it's interesting to say to see that um, 
um, to see that exactly what I what no now the translation is a bit off. Um, so for me, the example makes clear um, that uh, the woman that you see here only started to be able to be entered these spheres of work once um, um, the the labor of uh, computing was degraded was not seen as um, uh, as a as a respectable type of work um, and that's something that is very important only when arithmetic or mathematics yeah let's say this type of computation ceased to be an intellectual activity and science activity might say for men only when arithmetic we can begin to be mechanical, yeah, mindless, mindless activity. Only then um, um, this form of mental work was degraded to assistant work and then it was feminized. Yeah, so you see always this typical, um, what we maybe call today gender gap um, as well happening um, in here. Um, and of course, next to the cheap labor also, there were a lot of stereotypes uh, and these women who we, um, uh, gewissenhaftigkeit. Um, sometimes they would even say the female way of able to to play the piano would lead well into and their softness uh, would lead well into this type of um, um, work so very stereotypical um, ideologies I would say here at work so now how do I go to the next slide ah Now, also here, here you can see just some impressions of um, of how uh, like an integrated circuit between is a bit a later one from the 20th century, but how, how the woman um, and the machine actually like uh, yeah asynchronized you could say, as it says in the sub um, sub description here, and we had all kinds of funny apparatuses trying to in a way improve the efficiency. Um, of the woman, just to give you now, we go slowly go in the, the 20th century. Um, always like, um, I don't know, to me, in a way, very much, um, especially the next one, uh, yeah, recalling um, female stereotypes and how uh, she like in this in this woman this type is can control your invoicing stock records and sales statistics all at once electronically but not without help from Susie her computer so you to, to me this is all very um from probably to you two very very uh, um clear stereotypes are being referenced to uh and um no my son woke up <laughs> Uh, and with this, I want to go to the to the uh, into the into the uh, more recent past um, integrated circuits and, and in circuits. Um, and we look at let's say more electronic rather than purely uh, mechanical um, calculating machines and specify which woman we are talking about. Yeah. So I would like to start here by quoting um, from the twenty fourteen essay from Lisa Nakamura. Um, um, and she writes, I also put it um, in yellow here for you to read, Haraway, Donna Haraway, of course, draws our attention to the irony that some must labor invisibly for others of us to feel, if not actually, be free and empowered through technology use. Techno science is indeed an integrated circuit. Um, one that both separates and connects laborers and users and where both genders benefit from cheap computers it is the flexible labor of women of color either outsourced or insourced that made and make or that made and continue to make this possible and this is to me a really uh, crucial quote um makes not only clear probably obviously that that this is uh, yeah this is true for the Capitalist mode of production in general, some must labor invisibly for others um, to feel free, if not actually be free. And um, but I think it is here, in, in, with, especially with regard when we talk about technology or science and technology, that um, that it, that this is a form of social production that is um, unfortunately still very much characterized as something that 
technology is something that just at one point is, is just there where is this, this is irgendwo einfach here it has not not much of a history this is not so much only because of silicon valley and their um, 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 geschichtslosigkeit their, 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 how do you say um the 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 inexistence of a of a history um and this ideology but also i think very much it is embedded especially i can say maybe for the german media theory uh, when we think of Hitler or something it's very much embedded that that we don't really have a history that we don't really have a genealogy of technology uh, science and technology that really looks at labor practices it's, it's very okay we, we know it comes somehow from military um that's often a reference but really to look into um who's exploited under what condition what type of um, work um, is being made invisible. This is something just to me very, very important. And in her essay, and I can really recommend it to read it, um, um, Nakamura um, actually demonstrates that computer hard, especially in the formative years of Silicon Valley, was largely produced by a group of women of color, Navajo women, to be precise. They assembled semiconductors on their Navajo land and at the Fairchild manufacturing planned in uh, New Mexico. So um, their work remained invisible and the workers themselves, of course, nameless. Um, we don't really find any mentioning in the, the Silicon uh, Valley canon. And of course, this is uh, not um, a singular fact as, as we probably by now all know. Uh, it's very um, usual in the dominant um, Anglo-American historiography um, that female computers that we saw in, in, the, in the first example, uh, the Navajo woman, uh, but also the countless other female laboratory assistants um, in the field of science and technology or other uh, female so-called doing, woman doing assistant work, um, they share the same fate. Um, and it's interesting to see that women not only performed these calculations, they were also responsible in fact for software in many places for instance during the second world war and uh, into the post-war decades now i go into a different area that i really um can recommend if you want to go into of the in, in into the um history of um of computer uh, history of science and technology history of computer um, 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 science when computers are a woman and Jennifer slide here she really uh, describes well the essential work of women in the development of the first um, um, large scale electronical computer that is called the ENIAC um, that was as you probably know uh, used to automate um, ballistic um, calculations which uh, in the first world war they were still carried out by human computers. Um, and yeah, so the women, as you know, um, always during wartime, um, millions of women uh, volunteered or were forced to perform mostly the indirect military service because they took over the jobs of the uh, men who had to um, go to war in industry and education. Um, but also the computer laboratories in the 40s in North America and Europe, they needed personnel. And this was where the women came in. Um, and they were uh, usually uh, had very good college degrees, um, were trained in mathematics or physics. And it is interesting to see that the, the, the work of computing, yeah, and, and I don't only mean Rechnen, Berechnung, but I mean um, actually to develop the software was considered menial, tedious, uh, mindless activity. So actually, what we have today is the male, mostly white, um, privileged computer programmer. It was completely different back then. It was the woman who did that. But at that, on, and, and on the other hand, the hard work to build these big kasten, to build these big machines, um, um, to build these uh, uh, big computers, that was supposed to be the, 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 the highly regarded work. Yeah. So it was, there was a complete switch later on. Um, and women again, we think about the Pickering's harem when, when we looked at the women um, that were doing the astronomical um, calculations, they were called kilo girls. They were geniac girls. It's always like this, this, this denigration of the female um, scientific contribution and, and their labor. So usually when you hear about the ENIAC, you hear about these two guys is um, Eckert and Mockley. And as we know, or as, as I'm trying to just to argue 
basically, if you want to speak metaphorical, the patriarchal front uh, for the Seite des Bildes and of the whole story. Um, so, for instance, here you can see um, an image that six in the New York Times, and I'm taking all of this from, from the Jennifer Light essay. You can see a man in the, in the foreground, in the background, very, um, this is already a bad print, yeah, but uh, from her essay, and um, in the background, only scheme wise, unsichtbar, invisibilized. The woman later on, this was reused for a military ad, um, and then you only see the man at all. Um, so you have a lot of, there's a lot of um, problems there, um, there's a lot of, um, Invisibilization and um, Kleinmachung, um, denigration of the, the female work. Their work was um, portrayed as standing at function tables or um, uh, setting switches, plugging cables, while the men were always um, the managers or um, the maintenance engineers. Yeah, so we see um, this very clear here. And Jennifer Light interestingly quotes the historian of science Stephen Chopin, and she says that they, these women, made the machines work, but they could not make the knowledge. Um, and I find that very interesting, but I would go one step further and say they could very well make the knowledge. In fact, they were doing it. Um, but um, their knowledge, of, yeah, their eventual made their machines work, but they did not own this knowledge. Yeah, it belonged to the military or the state, and later today it belongs to um, the tech companies um, or to or the computer companies. So. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, important to see, and it's, it's very much um, the same today. Uh, if you think about, for instance, this is a bit also. I'm, I'm researching the, um, this. Um, I'm, I'm doing my, my research on this in my PhD, which is about the gig workers who label AI training data, um, and so, so to speak, the, 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 the belly of, of, of the AI industries that are very important today. Um, as we all uh, uh, know, and is it still the same um, access of invisible labor, exploited labor, extremely precarious labor that is not being um, um, re regarded as any worth, as, as any, um, any mind put into it. Um, yeah, I think I, I just stop here because I see the all the smart things that I wanted to say in German. I was so happy to finally be able to speak in German. Um, I will just stop here. Um, let's see what I have. Yeah, we're here just to show you these images. Um, then we um, can go into the conversation. So you see here how the women are being made to stand next to the ENIAC, yeah? And what they do is they hold the cable. They, they plug, uh, they, they, they hold the plug here, yeah? On the right, sorry, there's some... Some, some blurb in the middle with the white pixel. Or here, another example in NASA, and they are very proud now that they had some women, especially also black uh, women in history of NASA. But also like you can just read from the subtitle when the woman, when the computer word skirt is, uh, is very um, sexist, uh, don't even know, yeah. Um, just to end here, and this is the last, um, that I really like the last sentence of, of, of Light's essay um, when she writes, as computers saturate daily life, it becomes critical to write women back into the history. They always were a part of in action, if not in memory.